Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for staying for the last session. Um, we're going to be talking about, sorry, let's go back one, base erosion and profit shifting, or BEPS. Has everybody heard of BEPS? Is there just an indication? Oh, there's one over there, one there? Okay. Um, this is kind of potentially a really heavy tax topic, um, but we're hopefully going to try and make it um, interesting and also focus not so much on the detail around these changes, but you know, broadly what they are and what the business impact is going to be, you know, what the impact is going to be. So in terms of um, um, the panel, perhaps before we get started, maybe I could just get each to say a little bit about themselves and, and their involvement with captives, but importantly, also, you know, just um, a little bit about their company and themselves, and so maybe starting with, with Kelvin. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelvin. So I'm the group risk and insurance manager for a company called International SOS. So International SOS um, is a company that provides medical and security assistance to corporates around the world. Um, and in that capacity, I manage the corporate insurance programs and also the risk management for the company itself. Um, then obviously, the, I guess the only reason why I'm on, I'm on this panel, because I'm not an expert of BEPS at all, is the fact that I am a captive owner. So International SOS has a captive, and, and as part of my responsibility, I, I, I have responsibility for the captive as well, for International SOS. Yeah. Thanks, Kelvin. Araki son. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Naoyoshi Araki. Uh, I'm a res representative of Japan Risk Specialist. Uh, we are the reinsurance broker in Japan and also insurance consultant in Japan. So uh, when we offer the proposed uh, insurance scheme to the Japanese company, so sometimes we offer including the captive scheme. So therefore, the sometimes uh, we act as a captive manager in Japan. My name is Go Ka Im. And you will note that I'm not Mr. but Miss. <laughs> and uh, I'm the head of the Re Tax and Revenue Practice Group of Shen Dalamo & Co. We are obviously one of the oldest um, law firms in Malaysia and uh, one of the first law firms to actually have a dedicated tax and revenue practice group that goes back over 40 years. And uh, we advise and we um, take up uh, litigation matters on all aspects of tax and revenue law, and uh, that's probably why I'm here to talk about BEPS. And back to Michael. Thanks very much. Um, before we start talking about BEPS and the BEPS changes and what they mean, um, I think it's important to note that um, you know, tax considerations have always been a factor insofar as, as captives have been concerned. Um, but, but maybe just kind of to set the scene a little bit before we talk about the BEPS changes. I mean, Kelvin, just maybe worthwhile just recapping a little bit on the sorts of considerations that would lead to, you know, in your case, the, you know, for your group, the establishment of a captive. Because I do think it becomes relevant to some of the other points we're going to talk about as we go through the session. Right. So um, for International SOS, so it's, it's, yes, it's a privately owned company. Um, the owners are French but the company was founded and headquartered out of Singapore. So actually, the company came about, the captive um, sort of inherited it, right? It came about in a merger and acquisition. The, the owners bought a company and the captive came along with it. Um, so so it, it, it's probably not the traditional model of why a company would set up a captive, but obviously what you then choose to do with it um, is, is totally different. And, and now it's very much used as a risk retention vehicle. Um, for historical reasons, when the captive was inherited, it was actually domiciled in Switzerland. And, and there was a business decision to then relocate the captive um, from Switzerland to Singapore. Uh, and obviously, it has nothing to do with tax considerations, uh, but, but a very conscious business case was built around the fact of why we wanted to move the captive from Switzerland to mm. Singapore. Yep. Uh, Raki, son, anything you would add in terms of, from, particularly from a Japanese corporate perspective? Yeah. We talk to the client or potential client as to the captive. Uh, 
I had the impression that three major points uh, the client uh, considered. The one is the final the result, I mean the profitability, and the second one is easy to access. I mean the time zone and also, for example, uh, the banking issue or something. And the last one is the credibility or uh, sustainability of the uh, domicile. Uh, so, the, for example, the regulation of the domicile is stable or not is uh, one of the key issues. And uh, separate from three points, and uh, you might know that in Japan, uh, the power of the major Japanese insurance company is so powerful. So therefore, the discussion with insurance company is also a very challenging issue mm. to set up the gap there. Okay, thank you, Araki-san. In terms of the background to BEPS, taxation has really been front page news for five years, or more than five years now. And that's not usually the case, but it, it very much has been the case. And I just wanted to take a little bit, little bit of a step back and. Um, almost as far back to the, to the GFC, because one of the responses to the GFC in a number of countries was austerity policies. And that then led to a focus around um, where money was being spent, particularly when you had governments kind of cutting benefits. And at the same time, you know, there was a lot of um, increased public focus, focus in the press around, well, we're cutting people's benefits, yet all these kind of people and other company, companies are not paying as much tax as they should. So it really came into focus. And perhaps most starkly um, in the UK, uh, particularly around 2012, and it led to a parliamentary committee led by, um, chaired by Margaret Hodge. But the tax practices of a number of multinationals very much came into focus, Amazon, Google, and in particular in the UK, Starbucks. And, um, and that led to really looking to understand why it was that a number of companies might have quite big businesses in places like the UK, but weren't paying a lot of corporate tax. And, and that kind of led to people realizing, well, the existing international tax rules were being used in such a way that you could produce a result that you had for, you know, quite little tax being paid in a location like the UK. And in the case of Starbucks, that result came about through an application of existing transfer pricing rules, accepted existing transfer pricing rules developed by the OECD. And transfer pricing, just to you know, explain that, is when you've got two companies within a group, when you've got related parties dealing with each other, the expectation is, the requirement is that they will deal with each other as if they were third parties, as if they're dealing with each other on an arm's length basis. Um, so there's rules to ensure that that result uh, occurs, and that was happening, yet it was still leading to the result that you had, for instance, you know, um, small amounts of tax being paid you know, by Starbucks in the UK. That public pressure led to political action, um, both at a domestic level, but what then happened was a number of countries then elevated that through the G20, and the OECD was asked to review the international tax rules. And that, was, that led to a project called the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, or the BEPS project. Um, and we'll see in a moment you know, what the focus there was. But this has been very much you know, um, a focus where there's been you know, strong public pressure, political pressure, and that international pressure to address these issues has risen and has continued to exist you know, to the point that the BEPS project came into existence the OECD reported, and now you have countries working to implement these measures, working to, to um, you know, almost kind of um, rewrite international tax rules, accepted international tax rules, and they are increasingly being implemented locally, including, as we'll see in a moment, um, here in Malaysia. So this has been a very, very important development. As we see in terms of that last quotation, which is actually one of my local colleagues, you know, BEPS has even come to town in Malaysia. So it's something we all have to deal with. It's something we all have to understand what it is. And importantly, what does it mean for our business? And obviously today we're talking about that in the context of, of a captive, but it's got broader application. So you do need to understand what is the impact on business models, 
um, multinational business models when you're dealing across border because these changes touch most aspects of cross-border business and the tax issues that, that can arise and do need to be addressed. So um, BEPS does have the potential to significantly impact captives. And some of the areas, just quickly, and we'll kind of get more into this as we get into the conversation, increased risk of double taxation. So, you know, the captive being um, taxed and those same profits being taxed elsewhere. Certainly there will be an increase in documentation requirement and reporting obligations. And I think the expectation is that we'll see increased tax scrutiny. If nothing else, tax authorities are going to have far greater vis visibility over multinational operations, multinational financial results in other countries. That will lead to more information leading to more tax audits and I think potentially more tax disputes, which I'm sure Ka Im is very much looking forward to. <laughs> um, so the, what we want to do today um, is to talk about the 15 action items, introduce those very broadly, and then what I want to do is pick out the ones that I think are most relevant to a captive operation. And then talk about, well, where are people at with that? What are they thinking, how are they thinking about it? What are the reactions to date? What, pe what should people be thinking about? And that's where Kelvin and Araki's son are gonna become very important in terms of you know, their perspectives, you know, for instance, as a captive owner, and what is that focus and where should that be? What are the things that people should take away from today in terms of thinking about um, you know, the, the implications of these developments? Um, and then finally, you know, how should we think to manage the risks that might arise you know, from these developments? So that's kind of what we want to do. But before getting into the conversation, I do just want to spend a little bit of time um, setting out some detail around BEPS. Um, so just these next couple of slides I'll go through very quickly. But basically, it's focused on um, addressing the sort of gaps and mismatches that could arise between different countries' tax systems that were being taken advantage of, were being perceived to be taken advantage of by multinationals to reduce the taxes they pay in the countries where they do business as opposed to the headquarter company. And that's seen to be, um, have greatest impact on developing countries, funnily enough, in, you know, in terms of, well, not funnily enough, but it, it seemed to have the, the greatest impact on developing countries and there's some st statistics there. So this was developed, this project was initiated by the G20, led by the OECD, took place over a couple of years. In 2015, the OECD issued a number of reports which are now in the process of being implemented. But this is designed to protect domestic tax bases. This is designed to ensure that, that profits are not unduly shifted from the country where the operations are conducted to other locations, and that's the sole focus. Um, dealing with mismatches, ensuring that profits are taxed where the activity is undertaken, for instance. So we now have more than 85 countries have um, signed up to this, including Malaysia, including Singapore, where I'm based, Kelvin's based, Japan obviously, as an OECD member, has been very involved in driving the BEPS project and has been a very early adopter of the BEPS action items. Um, so that is a sort of some broad background, but in terms of these 15 action items that, that we talk about, these are the action items. Um, and then broadly, they're designed to deal with three issues that were seen to exist in terms of the interna existing international tax environment. So gaps which allowed profits not to be taxed um, as they should be. Um, and then the second sort of set of uh, action items were, were focused on dealing with with frictions. And then finally, the, th the third set was focused on enhanced transparency, ensuring tax authorities have much more visibility over, um, over t operations and, and, and where it is that, that taxes, you know, where tax might not have been sort of properly accounted for. Um, but in terms of, you know, these changes, I'm not gonna go through these in, in detail, but you can see just, you know, very you know, uh, immediately that they're very kind of broadly focused. So um, dealing with um, you know, specifics like um, hybrid mismatches where one instrument is treated differently in two locations, recommendations around enhancing control for foreign, co foreign corporation rules, which is not something in Singapore and Malaysia that we have as territorial tax systems, but 
countries like Japan, which is a worldwide tax system, have these control from corporation rules to ensure that tax haven profits are taxed back in the home country. So there's recommendations around enhancing those. There's a set of recommendations around excessive leverage because interest deductions can reduce taxes that are paid. So recommendations around limiting that. Um, action five is focused on countering harmful tax practices. So jurisdictions that might have a preferential tax regime, recommendations around how that should be dealt with. Um, in terms of the frictions and substance, importantly, action six is focused on tax treaty abuse. So not allowing tax treaties to be abused and used um, in a way that's improper. And they do that by recommending either the introduction of a limitations of benefit clause or what they call a principal purpose test. Action seven is focused on permanent establishments and actually reducing the standard, the requirements before a permanent establishment will have to be recognized in another location. And a lot of the planning that was seen to be um, unhelpful and led to base erosion and profit shifting was around avoiding a permanent establishment via, you know, in terms of how the rules had been kind of currently structured. There's a lot of focus in these reports around transfer pricing. So actions eight to 10 are essentially focused around transfer pricing and ensuring that profits are taxed where the value is created. But going a bit further and, and, and allowing for transactions to be recharacterized, and we'll see that in a little bit. And then finally, transparency, and perhaps the one, the action item here that is most in focus and has been adopted most quickly is around um, transfer pricing documentation, transfer pricing disclosures, and the introduction of something that's called country by country reporting. So for instance, a Malaysian headquartered company will now have to provide a report to the Malaysian tax authority with information on their worldwide operations and all the countries they do business in terms of revenue and whatnot. And then the Malaysian tax authority will exchange that with all the other countries. So they're gonna have visibility over the total group operations. Uh, in terms of you know, people and revenue and taxes paid. It's designed to give people much more information so they can risk assess where it is that they might focus in terms of reviews and in particular transfer pricing reviews. So you've got these 15 action items and each was subject to a report by the OECD. What then's happened is that this has to be implemented. In terms of a number of the action items, that will be implemented through domestic law changes. So the local law will have to change and that's how that will be implemented. So things like control foreign corporation rules, enhanced CFC rules, that will be through changes to domestic legislation. We won't see that in Malaysia, for instance, because we don't have those rules. Um, you know, limiting tax deductions, that will be through, you know, the, uh, limiting interest, deduct in interest expense deductibility, that will be through domestic tax changes. The transfer pricing changes in actions eight to 10 will be introduced via the adoption of, um, via their introduction into the OECD transfer pricing guidance, and then that will be implemented, accepted, you know, built into local guidance. Some of the changes will be, impl will be implemented via a multilateral treaty, which will kind of then effectively import all of these changes into existing tax treaties. So for instance, action six and action seven that those changes will be introduced via changes to tax treaties. And then finally, the monitoring you know, will be through um, exchange of information and monitoring by the OECD and the Global Forum. So they're, the, they're broadly the 15 action items. So you know, the OECD has prepared these reports, they deal with a bunch of different things, all designed to deal with what was perceived um, you know, tax practices which led to tax bases being eroded, local tax countries, domestic tax systems, tax bases being eroded. This is how they will be introduced. And perhaps as an example, Kaim, what's Malaysia doing? Well, going back to January of this year, the second finance minister, uh, Datuk Johari Abdul Ghani, at a meeting in Paris, actually uh, announced uh, Malaysia would um, enter into the BEPS um, framework. And um, following that, you can see now that, um, for instance, the transfer pricing guidelines have been updated just last month. Um, we've had them since 2012, but um, in the amendments that came in last month, there have been uh, substantial changes to various chapters, um, including chapters 1, 8 and 11, 
dealing with the arm's length principle, intangibles and documentation. There's also been a new chapter added, which is uh, chapter 10 on commodity transactions. And the country by country reporting that Michael referred to earlier, that actually came in at the end of last year. So moving forward, um, Malaysian companies will have to be aware that they need to prepare these reports. Uh, and uh, these reports will then be shared with um, tax authorities in other countries in the world where they have um, either subsidiaries or affiliates. So that, that's the position at the moment in Malaysia, but it's, it's going to keep changing because yeah. there are still more, and, and the revenue has said as such as much, that there are still more uh, adaptation and updates that they will be introducing to the transfer pricing guidelines to bring it in line with um, you know, actions 8 to 10, uh, particularly in regards to initiatives that, are, that will be taken um, to comply with um, the BEPS report. Hmm. And I think, that's, I think that's a key point. I mean, we now are in the stage where these action items are being implemented. The rate of implementation, you know, is not, it can vary. I mean, you have had some countries, particularly in the region, which have been very fast adopters. So Japan and Australia and South Korea as OECD members, you have seen a much faster adoption. Um, particularly in terms of ref the, the domestic law reforms. Um, but other countries, you know, Singapore, Malaysia, elsewhere in the region, Indonesia, um, consistent with having adopted the, the minimum framework, you know, these, these changes are being implemented. And the set of changes that have been most quickly implemented do relate to transfer pricing documentation and country by country reporting. That has certainly been um, something we've seen implemented kind of consistently across the region. Um, the updating of guidelines to reflect these new transfer pricing principles around actions eight to 10 have been implemented. But there are other changes that, that are and will be implemented. So it is a very um, dynamic environment that we're in, in terms of all of these new rules, you know, the a new international tax order being adopted, um, you know, globally. And, and uh, our firm at least refers to this as the global tax reset. This is really quite a fundamental set of changes. But like anything, it is a set of changes, you know, and we have to then understand what they are. We then have to understand what they mean in a given context, in a given business context, and then determine what changes might need to be made to adapt to it. So we shouldn't be frightened by it, we shouldn't be in denial about it, we shouldn't ignore it, we should just look to understand it, look to understand what the local implementation is, look to understand where it impacts us, but importantly then look to understand how it impacts in a given business context. And I think that's hopefully kind of a, you know, the, one of the key messages for today. But in terms of when we think about that question of impact, for a captive, when we look at those 15 action items, what are the ones that perhaps have the most impact for a captive? What are the ones that we need to most understand the detail around? And I think you know, we can break this down to, to three or four or five of the action items, and then once we do that, we'll have, we'll have a discussion around it. But I think you know, the first point to note is that when you read overall the BEPS reports, there are references to captives. So you know, it, it has been framed you know, not, spe not specifically with them in mind and addressing them, but it is kind of referenced, they are referenced. And obviously, you know, going back, you know, many years, you know, from a tax authority perspective, there has been a focus in any event and, and, and different countries have had, you know, different sets of requirements around these and looked at them differently, but, you know, it has been in focus and, and clearly there's been a response and those requirements have been met to date. So potentially we have some new requirements we have to understand and look to adapt. In terms of the CFC rules, action three, if you're headquartered in a jurisdiction that has CFC rules and the, um, the rules are enhanced in line with the recommendations, potentially it will have an impact if you do have a captive within the group. So that's one action item where there might be an impact. Not so much relevant for a Singapore group, um, Malaysian group, but certainly potentially relevant for a Japanese group depending on the changes that get made to those rules. Interest deduction limitations are obviously going to be very relevant for groups, including groups with, with captives. Um, and it's important to note that 
you know, there are going to be special deduction rules developed for banks and insurance companies, but we know that captives will be excluded from that. So I think that's, that's important to know. Um, action seven, which deals with permanent establishments, I guess the, can have an impact. I guess the key impact there is that the, what's required to create a permanent establishment in a jurisdiction, that standard is, is reduced. Um, it's not just a question of have I concluded a contract for somebody else, but have I done a lot of, lot of the stuff that will lead to that um, so that it's really kind of a more mechanical action that's going to need to be taken elsewhere. The definition of an independent agent has been narrowed. So basically, you know, the ability to create a permanent establishment if somebody's doing something for you in another location needs to be re-looked at because these definitions you know, have been changed. On this one, the important thing, this is not going to be introduced via domestic changes, but by changes to tax treaties. And how that's being done is via the entry into what they call multilateral instrument, which will then have the effect of, um, it's a one, in, one instrument, then, but then that has the effect of changing tax treaties between any two countries. But a number of countries have reserved out of this. So you've really got to kind of look at, you know, depending on what, how the multilateral instrument, you know, who, who's agreed to what, what impact does that actually have on tax treaties? So will it actually have the effect of making these definitional changes? You know, the one that I think is most relevant, is going to be very, very relevant um, in a captive context, is these changes to the transfer pricing guidelines, these action 8 to 10 changes, which at a broad level is designed to ensure that transfer pricing outcomes, which is really allocation of revenue to, to one or more, you know, to two or more entities involved in, you know, in, in a related party transaction, in a related uh, party situation, better align with value creation. But within that, there's some very specific changes. So um, you know, there's one focus, for instance, in Action 9 around risk and risk, all allocation of risk and responsibility for risk. To date, the party, the entity that um, has responsibility for the risk got the profit, you know, got a return that was commensurate with being the risk-taking entity. Now with these changes, the focus is on not just who has the risk, but the entity that has it, is it really um, in a position to meaningfully exercise management and control over that risk? Um, and does it have the financial capacity to assume that risk? If it doesn't, at least from a transfer pricing perspective, the return that it gets will go from being more of the profit to uh, a more risk-free type return. Um, so these changes are looking to, to really change how transfer pricing operates to, to allocate the return to an entity, particularly those where you've had um, you know, the risk assumption. Um, the other thing that it can do is recharacterize transactions which are not viewed to be commercially, commercially rational. Um, so if you've got a, expense, a premium being paid to a captive, and it's not viewed to be a rational, commercially rational transaction, the deduction, you know, the transaction could be recharacterized and the deduction disallowed. So that's important. Um, you know, I guess in terms of the other actions, potentially action five might be relevant. So a jurisdiction might have a specific preferential tax regime for captives that will be reviewed as against the, um, the requirements for an acceptable um, tax regime, preferential tax regime. Um, action six potentially is also relevant. I mean, if I'm claiming a deduc deduction, so if I'm making a premium payment and there's withholding tax and I claim a tax treaty reduction on that, you know, the whole principal purpose test will come into play and that's fundamentally focused on the substance of the arrangements and the parties to whom that payment is being made. I mean, Kaim, is there anything else in terms of like of the action items, do you think they're probably the ones that, that are most relevant? Um, yeah. I think currently they are, and I think um, in terms of captives, uh, definitely 7, 8 to 10 and 13, I think, are the ones that uh, immediately come to mind as um, something that should be focused upon. Um, and uh, I'm sure Kevin and Araki-san can give us um, examples of, um, you know, where their respective uh, companies are concerned, how, how they've approached uh, the introduction of that. Well, maybe just before, quickly before doing that, just, um, just one, I guess one other 
final action item, which I think is relevant to note, is Action 13, which is this country by country reporting. So tax authorities are going to have greater visibility over a group's entire operations globally. So they're going to know, for instance, if you've got um, an entity, potentially you're going to know if you've got an entity in a, in a tax haven which has lots of profit and not many employees, for instance. And then they're going to use that in terms of risk assessment and saying, should I do a tax audit there? So I think that's, that's a very important development. And Malaysia and Singapore and Indonesia and a whole bunch of countries have now implemented this. And this has been one of the BEPS measures is that, that has been um, adopted earliest, and that's yeah. where we've seen you know, yeah. the, the, the greatest change. The yeah. other is increasingly, as Ka'im noticed in, noted in Malaysia, the adoption of the new transfer pricing guidelines around Action 10 into domestic guidelines. So they're, they're the areas we're perhaps seeing it most. And just in terms of actions 8 to 10, I've included a couple of slides which just kind of get into a little bit more detail around what these changes are without kind of getting sort of super detailed and super technical, but just because this is important and just trying to kind of summarise what really the essence of those changes is about. And, and again, it's about allowing for the non-recognition of a transaction that's viewed to be commercially irrational so that um, unrelated parties under comparable economic circumstances would not enter into that transaction. So that's something that authorities will, um, would be focused on. And the BEPS report itself on Action 9 gives an example, um, a captive example. So that's, I've just included that up on the screen. So a manufacturing company located in an area prone to flooding takes out insurance from an associated company in respect of inventory and plant in exchange for a premium of 80% of the value of the inventory, property and contents. Given the substantial likelihood of claims, there's no active market for that risk. Action 8 to 10 states that the captive insurance arrangement is commercially irrational and there is no market for insurance given the substantial likelihood of claims. As such, the transaction should not be um, uh, recognised an insurance premium would not be tax deductible for the manufacturing company. So the, the report actually gives that as an example. So the question, you know, non-recognition if it's commercially irrational is one example of actions 8 to 10 and what we now have to take into account. Um, the other is, and I mentioned this earlier, this increased emphasis on demonstrating control over risk in the entity, sorry, control over the risk in the entity taking on that risk. So within the entity, there, and this is just coming straight from the report itself, within the entity itself, there has to be um, decision makers who are competent and experienced who have access to the information and can take on that decision. Um, so you have to have control over the risk and people who can take, you know, who can sensibly take those decisions within the entity it, itself. Um, so, and again, and that's getting into a little bit of detail, but hopefully not, <laughs> Hopefully not too much detail. So I guess, I guess the key point is that we have these action items. Um, a number of those are potentially relevant to captives. These are in the process of being implemented through domestic law changes like country by country reporting, which we've seen in Malaysia, or through, in the case of action eight to 10, transfer pricing, local transfer pricing guidelines incorporating this OECD guidance. So there's a lot that seems relevant. A lot of BEP seems relevant um, to captives. So I guess now the question, you know, perhaps starting with, with Kelvin, is are people aware of this? I mean, the, the other owners that you talk to here in, in the region or in Europe, I mean, are people aware of this? Um, and how are, they, how are they reacting? I mean, what, what are their reactions to this, at, le at least a kind of first instance? Yeah. Right, yeah, like I said, Speaking to peers, like particularly risk manager peers of European-based companies, there's definitely a very strong awareness of BEPS, that's for sure. Uh, you have even seen the Association for Risk Managers in Europe, so a firm, they are issuing guidance papers around it. And, and I think one of the most obvious things when you look at the example that the OECD re, like report was outlining when they make references to the captive, um, is how little they understand about the captive. Because the nature of the risk that they're describing out there in, in the example that you gave um, is very loosely worded. I mm. mean, the likelihood is going to happen. What's the likelihood? Yeah. Um, and and how, how do you actually price the risk? And it mm. shows how, how little they actually understand about what sort of risk is supposed to go into a captive to begin with. Mm. And I think that is the challenge that a lot of, of risk managers are facing with, that, that they, whilst, whilst because of the way that captive has been mentioned, 
um, in all the best regulation. It seems like it's a target, um, but there's a lack of understanding from the regulators of what a captive is meant to be used for to begin with. And, and so I would say as, as, a, as a risk manager, if you were to step back and you, and, and you were to go through the proper process of ascertaining why you would want to set up a captive in the first place, um, and, and, and broadly speaking, you should be looking at the three main areas of, like, say, the commercial vi viability of it, this, the, the substance and governance of it, and obviously the, the transfer pricing. So how is the risk being priced? And I guess in all these er areas, there will be a lot of experts here sitting in the audience and, cons and consultants who are dying to offer you the, the, the proper way to structure that business case to evidence it. Mm. And, and, and if you were to go through with that process, you would find that the regulations that BEPS is, is, is talking about, it, it, it shouldn't be that far of a stretch for a, for a captive owner to fulfill and to evidence. And, and, and whilst a lot of the conversation has been focused around the transfer pricing aspect, or rather mm. the risk transfer pricing aspect, I, like, I think from a captive owner point of view, that is actually not that much of a concern. You can quite easily evidence the, 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 the market rate for a risk to be placed out in the market and how you are pricing it comparatively in the captive. Um, what I think is, is of a greater concern for captive owners is in terms of evidencing the substance of the captive domicile, of where the location is, and, and also what is the economic activity being generated in that country. Hmm. So, so from my point of view, um, for International SOS, I, I have a slight advantage because my captive is domiciled in Singapore and the parent company is headquartered out of Singapore. So, so that obviously takes a strong box for me in terms of ev evidence in economic activity. But if you were, uh, for example, a Japanese or a UK-based company and your choice of a captive domicile is elsewhere, um, the Isle of Man, Guernsey and so on, where you might not have any operations there, that could be a bigger stretch. I'm not saying that's impossible, but then obviously then you have to build out a business case of where is the economic activity mm. coming from. Yeah, so. In terms of that, I mean, and I want to come to Iraqi Sun in a sec and understand the reactions in Japan. Um, but in terms of the, the current understanding, is that sort of still at okay, BEPS without too much finer understanding of the detail? Or is it, has it gotten down to these sort of things? Yeah, okay, I know that... I know that I've got to focus on my transfer pricing. I know that there's a risk of transactions being recharacterized. I know that there's a, a need to focus on, re -look, really look at you know, um, the control over the risk in the entity, for instance. Is it down to that level at the moment, or is it still kind of a bit broader, kind of BEPS and... Well, know? I can't speak for the market, but mm. definitely for, for, for my captive, that's something we have been looking at yeah. already, like yeah. in terms of making sure that how are we doing if we, we ever were, were, were required to evidence to These be compliant issues. with BEPS. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when we went through that process, um, we did not find it too onerous to show that, yeah, we are, we are actually ticking the boxes in terms mm. of the transfer pricing, in terms mm. of the substance of activity, yeah. in terms of the commercial rationale. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, and just going back to a point I made earlier, I mean, transfer pricing has been very much the earliest aspect of BEPS that we have been focused on. You know, I mean, country by country reporting was introduced and, and these guidelines are changing. Araki san I mean, in terms of Japanese groups, and, and Japan was obviously an early adopter, um, has, has really um, taken a lead with a lot of these initiatives at the OECD level. I mean, what's the, what's the reaction in Japan? You know, what, what sort of things are clients saying to you? I mean, how is your own group responding to these type of changes? You know? Okay, uh, the Japanese government uh, has uh, investigated and uh, uh, discussed this issue for a few years. However, uh, I have the impression that in general, the big Japanese company, especially co uh, conservative company, have the negative image of the tax planning and tax saving issue. So, especially the company doing B2C business uh, is very keen to the corporate image uh, for the, uh, to the market. Uh, however, the Japanese government uh, investigated that this issue so the end of last year, the ruling party, Japanese ruling party, uh, released the proposal of a new tax regime uh, uh, focusing on the uh, tax saving issue. So, 
in this connection, the, we have discussed the client and the potential client, how to consider this issue. Mm -hmm. However, at this stage, as far as I know, no concrete statement has been released of the Japanese tax authority. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are struggling how mm -hmm. to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But your Japanese clients are, are now aware of these developments and, yes. and what they mean. Yeah, indeed. And are they, re are they making changes or looking to review operations or are they um, slower to think about setting up a captive, for instance? Um, or? I don't think so. Uh, the, I mentioned the conservative companies had the negative image of the tax planning issue. Mm. However, on the contrary, the big uh, international company like Amazon and Starbucks mm. <laughs> save a lot of uh, tax. Mm. Uh, mm. So the Japanese company not keen to mm. the tax saving issue. So mm. the, how to compete the, the big company, international company. So they mm. are, uh, start to consider mm. how to manage mm. the efficiently the financial issue. Mm. Okay, in terms of Malaysian, multinationals, you know, are they is this kind of really coming into focus now and, and particularly rethinking things around transfer pricing and whatnot? Um, I, I think of all the companies, <laughs> um, multinationals will definitely be the ones that are most aware of uh, the impact of the amendments to the transfer pricing guidelines and of course the uh, introduction of the country by country reporting for Action 13 that's you know, completely new and completely radical. So they'll, they'll realise by now that with, when, when that uh, comes actually into force in the sense that they start preparing these reports, that in a sense there's nowhere left to hide because you know, all your um, activities in other countries where, where you have subsidiaries and affiliates, um, your profits, how much tax you pay, mm. you know, all that's going to be in there and, and that's going to be open um, for the tax authorities to, to see and they'll be completely aware. So I, I think that this has caused uh, a lot of MNCs to really rethink, relook their preparations, their documentation and um, th I think they're definitely a step ahead of all other types of companies. And I think where captives are concerned, it, it, the revenue is, because it's so new, I mean, the, the guidelines, the amendments to the guidelines were only introduced in July. Um, country by country reporting rules were only gazetted in December of last year. Um, the revenue themselves are still grappling with this, this new scene. And um, the, the focus, I would imagine, would not immediately be on captives. Mm but would probably be with um, the larger companies, the MNCs, um, the listed companies. Mm. But there is now kind of an appreciation that this new environment is here to stay and yeah. we have to understand what it means and the impacts and, yeah. and adjust accordingly, whatever those adjustments might be. Yeah. Yes, and prepare accordingly, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, just kind of the um, and this is kind of summarising kind of a couple of the points that have been made, but also just, you know, what sort of questions would flow from, you know, these action items and the sort of, you know, issues that are in focus. But, and, 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 and Calvin mentioned this. I mean, you know, so some of the questions that, you know, you would stop and, and start to think about in response to these changes that we've described would be, you know, are you, do you have substance? You know, are you performing substantive activities? Um, you know, going to this point around rational versus irrational transactions. I mean, would the transactions of the captive have been agreed between unrelated parties under comparable economic circumstances? So, you know, so broader focus on the entity, looking at the transactions, you know, to the extent that decision making and people around taking on risk is important to prevent recharacterization from a transfer pricing perspective and allocation of the profit elsewhere. Um, you know, where is the decision making and, and is that in the right location? Is the captive controlling the risks of the transaction, you know, going back to the, to, to the action nine requirement? It's very focused on does that entity control the risks? Does it have the financial capability? Is the transfer pricing correct in view of these new requirements, particularly these, this ability for tax authorities now to 
recharacterize transactions. And I think you know, the point is that if there is an adjustment to transfer pricing, that will lead to double taxation. And, and I think the transparency that's going to come from things like country by country reporting, enhanced transfer pricing documentation, will lead to greater visibility, will lead to greater tax audits, will lead to greater adjustments, will lead to greater disputes. And that's where you know, tax authorities then, there's a mechanism where they'll come together and say, actually, were you right in making that adjustment? Because if they make an adjustment, there is double tax. There's a mechanism in the treaties to make sure that that doesn't happen, and that's um, called the MAP process. So we will see tax authorities increasingly engaging themselves around these type issues, and that will lead to the understanding. And again, importantly, you know, to uh, point it, you know, to reiterate um, that, that Calvin had made, is their supporting documentation. Because obviously when it comes to explaining these things to tax authorities, um, it's always so much easier when you've got the right supporting documentation. So these are, and this is just a few of them, but these are sort of some of the questions that you know, people would start to, are starting to ask in response to these new requirements. And, you know, and Kelvin, for instance, as a captive owner, mentioned a number of these. But Kelvin, I mean, in terms of the process that you've gone through, were, were there other kind of issues or questions that you started to consider? Are there others that you would recommend that people focus on in terms of you know, thinking about the impact of these changes in a given situation? Yeah, like, like I suppose it's to also recognize the uniqueness of a captive. So like just to mm. take, for example, one of the question up, like up there, is the captive effectively controlling the risk of the mm. transaction? Like what are you referring when you say the risk? Like mm. the risk is the financial exposure um, of, of what you are underwriting. Um, when the captive say, for, for example, if you retain some parts of a property exposure into mm. a captive, mm. the captive in essence does not control the property in question. It doesn't. So, so it depends on to what level are you drilling down when you say the control of the risk. The mm. captive is controlling the financial exposure that arises from this arrangement mm. because you must recognize that the captive is an insurance company at the end of the day. Mm. The risk associated with financial exposure. So, so, but then when you look at how they are applying BEPS concept to subsidiaries in offshore domiciles and they say risk, they are talking about business risk and economic activity, which is a bit different when you're talking about insurance transaction mm. in that sense, right? Mm. So, so like, I guess it's to be very cognizant of the fact that, that, that when you set up a captive, what is this used for? It's not your normal operating business subsidiary. It's there to underwrite the business of insurance. Mm. And so the risk and exposure associated with it is entirely different from what you would say for a normal um, op, op core or subsidiary of a core mm. business. And I think that is key. So once you get that sort sorted, then the business case and everything should flow from there around building a captive and not for a subsidiary doing something else altogether. And I think that, and I think that's a really good point in that, particularly when we talk about these action eight to ten requirements like risk and the focus on risk. I mean, these are written as transfer pricing guidance, which will be reflected locally. But at at first instance, they're going to be applied by tax people and tax authorities, and they're not necessarily going to have that deep business understanding, right? Um, so I think, I think there's two aspects. To it. One, one you mentioned earlier was then really the importance of, at an industry level, engaging with tax authorities so that they do understand the business. And, and I think you gave the example earlier of the firmer paper that had been written for the OECD and a number of, a number of countries. And I think, um, I think that, that's an important point. Um, you know, the other then comes back to the documentation, um, you know, transfer pricing documentation, other documentation that, that explains this because, you know, you know, not having an unnecessary adjustment will be a function of the authorities understanding that and, and the documentation and being very thoughtful about that becomes very important and, and you had mentioned that earlier. Um, Kaim, just in terms of like a local Malaysian context, I guess, you know, that's also important, right, in terms of, you know, mitigating the risk of tax authorities uh, looking at a transaction incorrectly, how well you document that becomes even more important now, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely so, because, um, you know, the first thing they will see uh, would be the documents. And if, if you don't have your documents accurately reflecting the position, or if, if there are mistakes in your documents, that's, that's what they're going to see first off. And um, trying to sort of um, amend that or correct that thereafter uh, would be a lot more difficult. And I think the other point, which Kelvin, without stating it explicitly, is kind of, it's like you just can't leave this to the tax guys, right? You've got to make sure that 
that, that tax and risk and other relevant people are coming together to make sure this is fully understood. And that, you know, to the extent that these new guidelines, you know, there's, there's an element of having to interpret it, as you've mentioned, that that's done very holistically and then that that's appropriately explained in documentation and, and, and in engagement and in terms of really, you know, reviewing and understanding you know, the transfer pricing, but also ensuring that the characterization of transactions and, and of an entity and of a contribution for transfer pricing purposes are correctly understood. Um, Araki san, any, uh, in terms of the sorts of questions that in Japan people are looking at, was there anything you would add to the conversation? Of the... Um, I think the, this trend is the positive issue because uh, in Japanese market, I think the captive has not been introduced broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the, if we came to the uh, tax minimization or tax planning issue, so then uh, the company realized uh, the captive scheme. So therefore, uh, we'd be able to introduce easily to the captive to the market. So that's why the um, also, a lot of discussion between the government or tax authority. However, overall, I think it, the trend is very positive. Hmm. Okay. Um, so I think what, where that leads us is, you know, what should people be doing? Um, and this is not just true of captives. This is true in the context of any um, uh, business company, multinational company that's conducting business across borders, where you're dealing with the tax systems of more than one country, you're dealing then with the interaction of those tax systems, which is where BEPS really starts to have an impact. And, and some of the recommendations that are made, um, and this is for, you know, obviously this is specific to captives, but you know, some of the recommendations that are made in terms of understanding these impacts and what people should be doing um, is you know, reviewing you know, the business operating models and guidelines. Um, you know, so for instance, if decisions are being, making for, being taken for the captive in another location, does that create a permanent establishment risk? Does the captive have the right sort of substance you know, in terms of action six? Do you have the right level of um, control um, decision making with respect to risk within the entity in terms of action nine? Is there the right sort of commercial rationale? Is the substance there? Is that documented? Are the transactions entered by the entity rational uh, as opposed to irrational? And uh, agreeing as I do with Kelvin's observation as to the example itself that was given, I think a number of people have been similarly critical of that, uh, of the example and what it means. Um, and you know, ensuring that the control over the risks being taken by the entity. Each of these kind of flows back to those slides around the relevant action items. So you know, you've got an action item, it, it has certain set of requirements, a certain set of impl uh, implications, they need to be understood as against the particular business that's been undertaken um, or that's been managed. Um, so there, there are a number of the um, steps that are recommended. Um, before getting to the next one in terms of engaging with tax authorities, but I mean, Kelvin, it sounds like you went through this type of process. I mean, would, is there anything you would add to those or within those kind of steps, are there any kind of comments that you would make? Like I think it would be to go back to first principles, right? So one of the overarching aims of BEPS, I mean not the only one, but the one, one of the main aims of BEPS was really to make sure that companies do not end up in a, what they call it, double non-taxation. And to put it very bluntly is to make sure companies are not avoiding tax. Right. So, so if, if you go back to first principles and you make sure you set up captive for the right reasons, and if your reason number one starts with tax, then I'm sorry, it's wrong. So, so, so but it's always been wrong, right? So if you go back to first yeah. principles and you have the right, right rationale when you set up a captive and, and, and the tax is just a, 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 a one of the considerations for, for sure for, for the captive to do business in the right dom domicile. Uh, but it's not the primary reason of why you set up a captive in the first place. So if you mm. go back to first principles, I think you should be fine um, with the best regu regulations in whatever ever shape or form they are being implemented mm. in, in, in the country. Yeah. And, and I think to, you know, to, to, to that point, I mean, the, the visibility, the monitoring, you know, looking at the, you know, looking at the entity, the results, the number of people, you know, the level of profit versus, you know, I mean, all of those type metrics are going to be picked up increasingly by tax authorities in terms of assessing 
assessing risk. And, and to your point, um, you know, it's not like these, these entities have not historically been subject to review. So all of the best practice around sort of substance, et cetera, has already existed. You know, this is an additional kind of set of requirements we need to think about. I mean, potentially an additional set of implications. So, you know, really understanding those, understanding the impact as against the business we have, the transactions we have, the substance within the entities, and just, you know, very deliberately undertaking the sort of reviews that, um, that, that are suggested, and not to be alarmist, and, and, and just keep it in context, right? Yeah, I think and, is what you're saying. And, and yeah. authorities are, are never going to be prescriptive, right? They are mm. never going to say it's okay if you have two employees and the revenue is X per employee and so on and so forth. They, they, they are never going to go down that ra mm. rabbit, rabbit hole of being so prescriptive to say this, then you'll be safe, because mm. they know that people will game the system again. So, mm. so then you have to start from the principle and foundations of why you want a captive to yeah. set up in the first place. So. Iraqi son, any other points around? how people should take these changes and, 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 and think about them and address them in terms of? Uh, this panel discussion is focusing on tax issue. However, mm. I think it's the, we need to focus on basic the concept of captive. Mm. So I mean, um, I think the, in the future, tax scheme might be changed. Mm. <laughs> uh, so therefore, the, we need to more consider and focus on uh, the risk management or uh, how to uh, manage the grow, uh, broadly of mm. the risk itself. So mm. I think it's more important to set up captive. Mm. Okay. I guess the final um, recommendation that is made around mitigating BEPS risk is a point that Kelvin made um, earlier on in the session, which is um, if there is a lack of understanding of captives, ensuring that there's the right level of engagement with bodies like the OECD or with local tax authorities in terms of you know, helping them understand that as a way of managing risk. I mean, obviously, you would otherwise do that through your own documentation, et cetera, in terms of addressing these requirements. Um, Calvin, you did mention the, the FIRMA report, which was written for the OECD, which kind of ex described things like the commercial rationale for captives and substance, etc. But do you want to quickly, do you mind, did you want to just quickly kind of recap a little bit on that report and just some of the kind of the key points that you took away? Yeah. Well, so, so the report by Firma, so, so, so Firma, like, I guess all of you heard the introduction by Steve just now about Parima. So, so Firma is the Parima for Europe, uh, where the risk managers um, are part of a professional association. And what they have done was really to come together to put together a paper that outlined the rationale for what a captive is being used for and what they feel that the, the BEPS regulation, the guidance should focus on when it comes to captives. Mm. And they have steered the focus of OECD towards three main areas of, of, a, for, of a captive, which is basically ensuring the, the, the commercial rationale so basically the business case for setting up a captive in the first place. Um, the second part of it is about substance and governance, and they provide some details around that, but, but those are around the, the control of the risk-taking of the captive. So, so stuff like having an underwriting committee at a captive that makes the decision and the involvement of, of the employees within the captive management itself. Um, and, and then obviously the third aspect of it is the risk transfer pricing. So what is the premium that a captive is charging its entities? Um, sure. And, and, and they, they have put forth a number of ways that a captive um, can evidence those. So what is clear as well is that there isn't just one way, there isn't just a fixed way that a captive can evidence all of this. So there are several ways, there's a, a several different ways, and, and it's up to you to make sure that the captive has one of those ways to do it. Hmm. So there, there, there isn't a fixed ABC way. And I guess what the takeaway from that as well is, I guess for um, risk manager associations in the region, like, like Marim in Malaysia and Parima for Asia, there's an avenue for us as risk managers to come together as well to make sure we are promoting that and, ed and educating the regulators in our region as well, like what makes sense for us. Because hmm. of, like, obviously for the European cap captives, they have the benefit or, 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 or rather the misfortune of solvency too. So they have been through that experience and there are certain benchmarks around that that they can use to fulfill the BEPS. 
for Asia is brand new and it also means that we, are, we, we have the leeway to craft what we feel is appropriate for captives yeah. in Asia dom uh, domiciles as well. Thanks, Calvin. No, that's great observations. We've got a couple of minutes left and I just thought maybe to finish off, you know, in terms of your takeaways from the discussion, you know, your reflections on BEPS, I mean, is there any kind of final observation or comment, uh, maybe starting with Kaim? I was just going to say that um, I'm sure most companies would already have um, transfer pricing documentation in place, but now with the changes that have come about since last month, the important thing to do is actually to take a look at those documentation that you already have, review them, compare them to the new requirements that have come out with the introduction of uh, the amendments and the new chapter in the transfer pricing guidelines, as well as the totally new requirement of country-by-country country reporting. So it's important to, to take a review of your existing documentation to make sure that um, you are in compliance with the new requirements. And uh, to keep in mind that you know, scrutiny from the inland revenue will come. And other tax authorities. Yeah. And other tax authorities. Because yeah. they're going to have the visibility that they've yes. not otherwise had. Araki-san, any final comment? Uh, yes. Uh, at the end of last year, the Japanese tax authority uh, came to our client's office to investigate the captive scheme. <laughs> uh, uh, so then uh, they uh, made a lot of questions to the client. Uh, however, the, finally, the authority uh, confirmed the captive scheme is the actual company, not paper company. Uh, so uh, this means um, the, in Japan, the, I had impression that captive has been introduced as a sort of black box. <laughs> However, the, it's not true. The captive is a licensed insurance company in the uh, respected domicile. So, that's so why uh, I'd like to uh, persuade and uh, introduce this issue to the client and the potential client in the Japanese market. Kelvin, any final points to add? Well, um, if you are not a captive owner, you're thinking of a captive, uh, don't let this put you off. This is no different from how you should have thinking about setting up a captive in the first place. <laughs> um, if you are already a captive own, like owner, don't be scared. Uh, just re revisit your business case and make sure that among your top three re reasons, tax shouldn't be up there so high. Just, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I can add to any of those um, comments, and um, I, think, I think all kind of really great takeaways from the discussion. Clearly, a lot of tax change, a lot of change to digest, but taking it in your stride, understanding the impacts, uh, reviewing as appropriate, making the changes as needed, as Karim mentioned, the importance of documentation. As Calvin's mentioned, you know, the importance of really making sure that you've got the right inputs into that process, you know, the risk perspective, the other perspectives, um, and that ability to explain to tax authorities on an individual company basis, but perhaps the importance of industry level um, engagement and education as we've seen in Europe. So with that, um, with that, um, um, my panel and I thank you, and um, please um, uh, join, I guess, with, with me in thanking them for their contributions. It's been, been a great discussion. Thank you.